Great. Great. So again, welcome to the Wake 9 uh, uh, Skill Up Meet uh, call of the OLS. Uh, and today we will discuss about open leaderships, uh, academia, industry, and beyond. And we will start with some talks from people that uh, will share their experience and what they are uh, working, what they are doing now. Um, Yo, I leave you the stage to introduce our first speaker. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so first up today, uh, we have Manuel Corpus. Um, I've known Manuel for quite a while um, through various different career stages, um, whether that be working in startups or um, research institutes. And I think now, am I right in saying that you're a lecturer, Manny? I'll pass it over to you. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's really great to see you all. and. I hope that I can make some sense. Um, obviously, these kind of talks um, are difficult to prepare because you talking about one's, one's uh, personalities and, and career is a bit, uh, I don't know, uh, tricky sometimes. Anyway, so before I go into that, how long, how long do I have and um, how, how long should I speak for? I would say 10 minutes, give or take. Um, and you can leave okay. time for questions and answers. Or if you run over a bit, we'll just have a little, little bit less time for questions. Right. OK. So that would take us to approximately 12.45. Is that correct? Yeah, approximately Yeah, that sounds right. Cool. So um, you want to talk to me, you want to, me to talk a bit about my, my trajectory. So. Um, uh, what am I doing? So currently I am a lecturer in genomics at the University of Westminster. I'm still a um, chief scientist for a startup company in Cambridge called Cambridge Precision Medicine. And I also have a sort of research and lectureship position at an online university in Madrid. Um, if you think about the wine Rioja, so it's called Universidad Internacional de la Rioja, so it's, um, which is the leading Spanish speaking uh, university. Um, and there I lead the uh, clinical genetics and personalized medicine program. So, um, in terms, of, uh, my understanding is that you wanted to know a bit more about my industry experience and how I got into that. So, um, at the time when I was a, a project leader at an institute of research called the, the Genome Analysis Center in Norwich, I was um, collaborating with a company, startup company in Cambridge called Repositive. And uh, through a shared grant, basically, um, they offered me the possibility of leading the scientific part of, of the company. And therefore, you know, I couldn't deal with the commute and that's because I was living in Cambridge and I had to commute to, to Norwich and basically I decided to take it. Um, I also felt that, you know, academia um, was a little bit stifling in the sense that um, I've, I've always wanted to um, think outside of the box and, and you know, that, that got me sometimes into trouble in the sense that, you know, I, I would challenge boundaries sometimes. And um, at my previous work, so I, I took on a lot of stuff. Um, I had PhD students, I have a, a research group of six people, etc. cetera. And um, also um, there was this uh, situation where my boss uh, was kicked out and so um, it was a, an uncomfortable situation and therefore I decided just to give, give um, industry a try. So I went from a completely academic uh, environment into a sort of Silicon Valley tech startup, um, you know, hyper growth um, when, when I, you know, I might have been like the eighth employee and when I left um, there, there would be like 25. So it, it really grew a lot. And it was probably one of the coolest kids in the block at, at that time in, in the Cambridge ecosystem. And so um, that was quite sort of eye opening in the sense that, you know, um, it got me into the understanding of how to raise 
uh, funds from sort of seed fund into more, for example, uh, stage A, stage, stage B of, of funding, you know, how to deal with in investors, how to basically um, for, forfeit your own interest, research interests, uh, for, for, for the sake of, of company hypergrowth. And, and also understanding how to make our product, which in that case was basically like a portal that allows you to find uh, genomics data sets from any experiment you can think of. And so um, ha have to, I had to sort of think about how to develop use cases that would attract more, more customers. I think they also used my, my sort of reputation in the field to, um, I guess, enhance the, the credibility of the company. And so it allowed me to travel to, to many places and it was very fast paced. But then uh, one, one, one year and four months later, uh, the company decided that they were going to restructure, restructure and, and that the, the sort of genomics finding capabilities, which was my main role in the company was going to be cut. So I, I was made redundant unexpectedly together with five more people. And then they, they sort of focused on, on a different type of product. So that was also a lesson because, um, you know, being a startup uh, environment means that there is no, not as much security as being in, in a sort of uh, established company. And at that point, because I was in one of the sort of incubators of companies in Cambridge, uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, I know very well the CEO and the and the um, uh, C chief operation officer. So you know, if they can do it, why can I not do it? So basically, based on the stuff that I learned from from this company, which is called Repositive, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to start my own company now. And and basically, this company is called Cambridge Precision Medicine, and is now. Um, at least five, seven people involved in different in different guises, and I made use of of the environment that I had sort of learned uh, with with Repositive to uh, first of all opening up the company, uh, asking for funds, uh, developing a vision, and so far, I mean, it's been a tremendous experience, and I I managed to get in touch with a. Uh, a a London uh, business angels network who decided to invest um, quite a bit of his money, uh, approximately. Well, I'm not going to say <laughs> that much, because, but anyway, uh, and, and his time. And this person um, is very experienced uh, because he was, um, he was in a different sort of uh, industry. He was in uh, uh, Shell before. Um, and this is my alarm that I need to wrap up. But anyway, so um, the company, running the company is not the same as, as being an employee of a company. And what I have found is that being a company, you really need to be prepared to do from washing the dishes to um, doing the accounts, to develop the software, to sell, to, and, and I think that, you know, uh, it's not for everybody, but I, I certainly feel that uh, through this process, I've gained a lot of confidence in, in my capabilities and, and hopefully in my ability to sort of become a better professional. And I leave it there. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, folks. Can we have a quick round of applause? That was actually a really, really interesting talk. Um, so we have some notes in the... Um, documents. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can add them either in the etherpad lines 97 to 99 or also in the Zoom chat if there's any specific questions you have for uh, Manny around his experiences. Um, I will leave a moment of silence to let those questions come in. If not, I have one. Malvika, go for it. Bernice had her hands first and then I'll go. 
Thanks for the talk. Really, it's interesting. But then, question then, why now being back to lecture then afterwards also? Because basically, um, I think I'm, I want to have both my feet in both both places um it, for me at the end of the day the company is is another model in which i can get money to do the stuff i'm interested in which is understanding how genome technologies will improve health and so all of all of the enterprises all of the stuff that i've done has been uh, focused towards my, my ultimate goal which is understanding the human genome uh, and, and having that very clear, I don't care if it's companies, if it's lectureship, if it's um, whatever, um, it's, it's as simple as that. They also provided me a good deal <laughs> that basically allows me to continue with the company, but then also using the, the, the sort of um, infrastructure to, to keep developing uh, my, my, my interests. Thank you. Maveki, you had a question as well, or was it the same one? Yeah, no, I think it's somewhat related. I, I mean, I'm really glad that you kind of shared a lot of problems in academia, which in turn can be seen by a lot of people, their own failure, yeah, you know, like being made redundant isn't someone's lack of skill. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that. But I also wanted to ask if you have some word of advice for people who go through similar experience because we kind of do see that ongoing in different organizations yeah so um if i mean it marika i really appreciate your your comments and in fact um I'm, i must say that i've i wanted to meet you for a long time uh, but anyway uh, um uh, we shall leave that for later from where i see it uh, you may say that I am successful, but actually from what I see it is a continuous <laughs> succession of failures with some uh, tiny successes. Uh, I, I mean, behind the scenes is being like completely random. And uh, coming back to, to your question in, ter in terms of advice. Uh, so if, if I was ever, if I was ever to say, was my personal secret for where I am right now, which is not, you know, I mean, there are many more people better than I am. My personal success has been my drive to network, 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 who you know. So it's not just, it's not just uh, your, how clever you are. No, no, you, you can't do stuff on your own. If you want to make an impact, you need, people around you who will work towards your vision. So you have to have your vision, but you also need to be able to, to build your network, have your contacts. Um, and, and, and another thing that I think I've been quite early and I think it's been quite good for me is my web presence. So um, if, if, if you look at my, if you do a Google search, whatever, everyone is gonna find me. And, and having as much web presence as possible has also helped me. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in through the etherpad as well. Am I right in thinking you need to leave in about 10 minutes? Yeah, sorry, I have another well, call. That's fine, that's fine. We'll make sure that we, we finish off before you have to disappear. Yeah, um, no and if, so the next question we have, um, do you have any thoughts on companies working on open source uh, software that started from academia and serve academic researchers? Sorry, I couldn't hear that because the, the little baby boy was there. So um, he's calling for Papa, I think. Um, can you repeat the question? No worries. Uh, so it was just asking if you had any thoughts on companies working in open source software that started and serve academics. Uh, well, um, I mean, uh, yes, I, I've, I've, I've been uh, surrounded by, by, by those type of companies. But, you know, for example, the one um, that comes to mind is Nebula Genomics, which is based in the US, but I'm sure there are many others around. Um, Repositive, the one I was working on, was also using um, uh, 
uh, open source. Another one that I can think of, which is based um, partly at Imperial, is called uh, Sigma Link. So, and, and that just um, without even prepare for it, but yes, I could, I could think of quite a few examples. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally don't see kind of a differentiation between a software company being open source or, 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 or closed source. I mean, I, if, if you do any kind of development, as you well know, you know you're going to use, regardless, you're going to use open source. I, I must admit, though, that my current company, um, the software is super, super uh, intellectual property. And um, even though we have published uh, a number of works in, in scientific journals, um, we don't publish the, 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 the close, the, the source code, because then, you know, it's, it's kind of our, our competitive edge. I do, I do push it to, to GitHub though, but only privately. <laughs> Always handy as backups that way. <laughs> um, okay, we have one more question I think we probably have time for. Um, so do you think working in industry requires a significantly different mindset from working in academia? Yes, uh, but I think the, the, the overlap is quite strong. I, the, the mindset uh, that um, I had to deal with was that as an academic, I wanted to share everything. I wanted to have credit for everything. I wanted to um, sort of um, put my name out there, you know, look all the stuff that I'm doing. And now I cannot do that uh, for, for the stuff that I'm doing in industry because, you know, somebody, somebody else is paying for it, right? So they own it. Of course, I own a bit. Uh, of it, but um, and I, f I, I found that challenging. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thought that, um, that there, there's someone might be offering you their business advice and offering you their money, but that also means that they get a say as well. So I guess- Oh, absolutely. Kind of the one who pays is the one who, who has the say. <laughs> you you suddenly you know you become uh, even though it's your idea uh, you become a, a kind of employee because they, they are the ones who are paying of course you you, you know it's not it's not it, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating right but you know it's and i think it's right because you know they you know good spending some some you know I, I we both want we have vested interest in in making that idea into a success uh, and and for that you need to be a little bit selfish if not a lot uh, but in a good way no you know like you have to make sure that that you have something that that makes you different something that you can sell some something that makes you um, sort of have something that people might want. I mean, it's all about the product, right? At the end of the day, and being able to sell something. I think I'm stating the obvious. Sorry about that. Right, I think we've found, found your, um, your experiences and your talks super, super interesting. Uh, so unless there's any final quick comments or thoughts, um, I think we can perhaps wrap up and set you free so you have a moment to breathe before your next call. Yeah, I'm just gonna put my email there. Um, so you guys feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, I, I'm always happy to network with people. I'm also on Twitter um, or LinkedIn. Amazing. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your time. Feel free to drop off as soon as you're ready. Um, and I think we'll move on to our next speaker, but we, we really value um, what your time and thoughts. Thank you. Cool. Um, our next speaker, folks, is um, someone I'm privileged to be able to call a colleague at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so we have Aki McFarlane, who actually works in the Wellcome's open research team. Aki, are you here? <laughs> I am indeed. Thank you very much, Yo. Uh, so Yo asked me here today to, uh, I paraphrase slightly, but uh, talk about how I got into uh, my job sort of in the policy and funder um, uh, sector. 
And um, I've warned her of this in advance, but uh, my talk is very much going to be about how I really sort of wander, wandered around my career without the aim of actually really ending up here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's okay, uh, is basically the message uh, that, that I want to bring to you today. Uh, I did prepare a little uh, timeline of my wandering career, which I actually found very helpful to look back on just as a sort of uh, um, a description of uh, how uh, I moved from space to space. Um, so let me share that with you. Uh, and I thought I would just sort of talk through uh, much like Manuel did. And uh, yeah, I always consider the start of my undergraduate degree as sort of the start of my career because of when I really started to think about what I might do next and why and how and, and, uh, and so on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as you'll see, I uh, started out a biology undergraduate and um, around the sort of same time that I started, I was also looking for a part-time job just to, you know, keep some pennies rolling in. And uh, I got a very, if I may be frank, boring, uh, a lab assistant job um, that, you know, while the stuff I was doing was quite dull, personal favorite writing, uh, the numbers one, two, 700, eight times over every week on test tubes. Um, <coughs> uh, the key here was it was very flexible around the hours of, of what I was doing. And also the team that I worked in uh, was really kind, friendly, and very accepting of my uh, slightly unexpected uh, working patterns. Uh, and that I think is one really important thing for me in my career has been the people I work closely with being decent people and uh, and having that flexibility to, to let you work the way that is best for you because that's best for everyone at the end of the day. Um, and once I had finished my undergraduate, I actually had um, applied for the place on the master's that you can see later on in the timeline. Um, but I decided actually to take a, uh, I think it was two six month contract jobs, but uh, a short term contract job, um, because it sounded interesting. And I thought I'll defer my master's place. Um, I almost cancelled the master's place because I was like, I've got this amazing job. Um, but some somewhere in me there was a, a wise owl who said just hold on to the master's place in case you don't like this job um and so i took up a job uh, after my undergraduate degree uh, at biomed central um an open access publisher which i didn't do by design uh really <laughs> at this point i was like this seems like a nice company um, and the job seems like something I can do. And that was sort of the criteria I applied, really, honestly, uh, at, at that stage uh, uh, of my life. But as you'll come to see, it actually has played quite a pivotal role um, in everything that came uh, after that, which I didn't appreciate at the time. Um, uh, and after I'd done two six month contracts on this, I thought, you know, this was nice. Um, and I had my sort of rose tinted sunglasses on and looking back at my time at Imperial and I thought, you know, I could go back, I could do another degree. So I took up that master's place I had deferred earlier and I actually went back to my um, bonkers lab assistant job uh, on the side as well. I sort of went almost full circle back to uh, how I had been before for a little while. Um, which was uh, probably displayed a, a lack of imagination on my part at that point. But I tried something new. I wasn't totally sure about it. So I thought, I'll go back to where I felt comfortable last and then step from there again. 
uh, which again, I think is a perfectly valid way to live your life. Uh, and after my master's, I uh, spent a little period job hunting. I think it's also important to recognize that you don't necessarily move from one thing to another totally smoothly. I think it was about five or six months I spent applying for every job under the sun and having a million interviews. Uh, but sort of the one big thing I'd learned about myself through my master's was I did not want to be doing independent research, um, which was a really important thing um, for keeping me on the path that, that I'm on as well. Because I did apply for a couple of research assistant jobs and I had uh, the option to choose between one of those and uh, a job at the Wellcome Trust which was somewhere I had always wanted to work. I once applied to be on the grad scheme. I was roundly rejected. Uh, they didn't stop me. I still applied for every job I could find there. And one of them, uh, the hiring manager, uh, we really hit it off and uh, got the job, which was great. Uh, but that again was a temporary contract. And uh, despite me really wanting to carry on with that particular role, which was in the funding division. So looking at um, research proposals coming in and advising researchers on what the, the peer reviewers were saying and so on and so forth. Um, really, really interesting, um, interesting stuff coming through. Uh, I was not really able to carry that on as a permanent contract. And I was told at this point, you know, you know, you, you're doing great and everything. You don't have a PhD and you really need a PhD to kind of progress in this particular role in this organization. And I think, you know, I had this message really strongly from many angles. And I think without my previous kind of really strong conviction that independent research was not for me, I probably would have gone down that route because I really enjoyed the job that I was doing and wanted to do whatever I could to keep doing it. But in the end, uh, I saw another job come up at Welcome, and I hadn't been thinking at all. Obviously, I knew Welcome was big in the open, uh, open research, open access space, but I hadn't been thinking I want to go into that at all. But at, at the moment, when I was uh, when I was casting around for what I was going to do next, that wasn't a PhD. This job just came across my desk at, at Welcome, working on the in the sort of open research team which wasn't really established at the time sort of becoming one of the founding members of the open research team and I thought do you know back in the day I worked at an open access publisher that would be enough to get me this job and uh, <laughs> it won't always be but it was at that point um, and uh, I think there there began my kind of real uh, open research career as it were so back in 2017 2016, 2017. Uh, and um, I worked very happily in the project officer uh, equivalent role uh, there for a good while until earlier this year when the open research team was uh, subsumed into the new research environment team. Uh, and at this point, having worked uh, on open research uh, issues for five or more years, uh, I was able to get a uh, specialist role, so open research specialist within my new wider ranging team. Um, and I will also say I thought really hard about whether I wanted to carry on down the role of uh, open research specialism. And uh, I mean, I could tell you, <laughs> spoiler alert, I did. Um, but uh, in all honesty, I don't know if that's forever. Um, yeah, I could very happily continue doing this work for a while, but I am not averse to anything else coming my way. Uh, and yeah, so having kind of started out on this whole path, what some people might think of as a little bit lost and casting around for things to do, uh, I like to think of as open-minded and ready for any opportunity. Um, and uh, so who knows where 
the next few few years will lead me. And I'm comfortable with that. And I think um, it's especially in this day and age, really important to be kind of comfortable with that. Uh, you never really can plan down to the T what is going to happen next. And it's kind of how you deal with the uncertainty uh, that uh, careers can bring that I think really makes or breaks it. So very happy to take uh, any questions. Um, let me just stop sharing this. Thank you, Aki. Folks, can we have a quick round of applause uh, just to thank Aki for sharing and a fantastic timeline there, really clearly visualized as well. Uh, questions pop in around about line 122 on the Etherpad, or feel free to share them in the Zoom chat or unmute. All are good. While you're typing, I'll also share, I totally forgot to mention, even though it was right in the middle of the screen in front of me, uh, that voluntary work is work experience as well. And I spent many happy Saturdays volunteering in the Science Museum doing something entirely different from all of my day jobs. And that brought a real nice richness to my life and career. And uh, as a tour guide gave me lots of presentation skills, which I may or may not be uh, executing brilliantly today. Uh, and so I would highly recommend if you've got a bit of extra time, do something completely different. So we have a question uh, from Saranjit. Did you not find it difficult to drop the PhD plan or do you plan to maybe take that up sometime in the future? I'm not sure I could be any more against the idea of me personally doing a PhD <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, honestly, my experience of doing my master's project just really told me that for me, coming up with something myself and carrying that out was not for me. And what was better for me was um, sort of a large organization. I've only worked for large organizations before where there are already plans and structures in place and fitting myself in there and finding my niche and how I can contribute to that larger plan is just for me personally, how I work best. And I know that that's, that's the way for me. So no. <laughs> I find it hard to get other people to drop my PhD plan. <laughs> I actually have a question as well. Oh, no, we have one here in the chat. Thank you, Aki. Not really a question, just to say that I really like that you highlighted the wandering. It happens more often than not that this is how people land in jobs they enjoy. And I can actually so fully agree and second that myself. 100%. I think. You know, a job description that you might get when you apply for a job is such a very small and weird snapshot of what you may be doing. Um, you often find that when you take a job, you think one aspect of it, will, of it will be what you actually enjoy. And when you're in it, it's actually something completely different and it leads you somewhere else. Um, and yeah, I like that kind of approach to life, but it, I know it can be a bit stressful. <laughs> So a question I have, um, so I think everyone who's here is, is at this call or in this cohort, also the people who will be watching later um, on YouTube, because they care very much about open research. Um, and I wonder, as someone who has had a lot of chance to see um, open research related grants passing your desk over the last few years, are there any specific tips that you would give to someone maybe writing their first grant application uh, for something open related? I think the thing that a lot of people spend time uh, on is talking about what their their idea will will do and what sort of un, unfilled niche it, it fills. And, and while that's important, I think actually what is often missing and is really important is what's what's the need, what's the demand, who wants to use this, what for, why, how much will people use it? Um, 
which is obviously difficult to write because it's or, or somewhat hypothetical. But that's sort of the discussion that, that funders have, you know, what is it that we're investing money in? Is it something that is going to um, make a big impact uh, in, in the world? And, you know, sometimes impact is a dirty word, but honestly, it's it can be defined in lots of different ways. But, you know, there's all kinds of brilliant ideas out there, theoretically, which would be brilliant. But if nobody wants it, there's dead in the water so we we need some kind of some kind of assurance that um what you're creating or uh, building will be uh used rather than just useful actually used um and yeah that's tricky but That's a really good point. My PhD supervisor would very often say to me, that's very nice, but so what? Why should I care? Tell me why. <laughs> uh, I think that sort of echoes that. Um, Nadine, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to expand around that. Um, no, it's fine. It's good. <laughs> Okay, um, we have another question from Saranjeet. How did you used to keep track of all the opportunities that came along when you were doing community work and did you ever feel overwhelmed by it? Great question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the community work though, what specifically you're referring to. Uh, so as you mentioned, working on Saturday, was that the Science Museum, maybe? Ah, yeah. So that was my uh, voluntary job uh, on the side, uh, as it were. Um, uh, that was sort of, that was very much my, I don't want to say downtime because it was work and effort, but um, I wouldn't say... Also, voluntary work, if I felt overwhelmed by it, I could not go <laughs> because I wasn't employed, right? Um, yes, absolutely. Palette cleanser, someone someone has, has, has put in the chat. Um, is, that's a really good description of, uh, of it. It's, it definitely sort of lifted me up at, at times when I was maybe struggling with the, the work, the nine to five, Monday to Friday work that I was doing. Um, and if I ever did feel that it was too much, I could uh, make my apologies and not go. Uh, and then that was OK. And that's, again, with voluntary work, the people who hire you as a volunteer are perfectly well expecting that kind of thing. And so it's, it's all fine and good by everyone, really. Um, and there were actually, you, the original question was, how did you keep track of the opportunities that, that came along? And, and um I think that's a good point. I did um, have the opportunity to learn various different um, tour giving uh, techniques at a point. So at one point I trained up to um, uh, give tours for the visually impaired, so audio description, which is very different to um, just actually talking and pointing at things because you have to actually describe the objects as well. Um, and that was, and that was a lot of work, but I, I really found that uh, important to do and provide uh, as, a, as a service. And um, no, so I think I didn't feel overwhelmed by that because I really felt the importance of it. And I was also free to spend as much or as little time on it uh, as I wanted. So that sort of side of voluntary work, uh, I think, is, is really valuable as well. You can get as much or as little from it um, as you need uh, at the time, really. I love to think of that as um, doing volunteer work to, to enrich you, not to make you miserable. Uh, I think that's an important lesson we possibly could all learn. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on the type of voluntary work, of course. Much of it enriches other people. Obviously, I think people enjoyed my gallery tours, but I don't think it really, you know, lifted anyone out of poverty, which some people's volunteering does do. And I think in, in some cases that can be really hard on, on you 
uh, as a person, but yeah, some types of voluntary work are, uh, as I said, really beneficial to you as a person, and it's totally acceptable to do either, both, or neither. Super. Uh, so folks, I think we have maybe one more question, and then we will move on. Uh, if anyone has any final thoughts, comments. Okay, in that case, anything final you would like to say, Aki? Uh, good luck to everyone. <laughs> uh, a really um, pivotal points uh, of your careers, uh, I think. I've dropped my email into the notepad. Uh, if there was anything in particular that you wanted to follow up on, uh, but otherwise, thanks very much for having me along. Thank you. We were really delighted to have you and appreciate uh, all of the time you took to share this, especially since I know you have a cold. Uh, so makes doing a talk just a little bit tougher. <laughs> Most of okay. my new thing has been for excessive sniffle time. Well, it was very well done. I noticed not a sniff. <laughs> Berenice, over to you to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, thanks, you. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce Sarah. So Sarah Gibson, she's currently an uh, open source infrastructure engineer, and she was a um, participant on the, one of the first court of OLS and Motor afterwards. So Sarah, the floor is you. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me along. And um, just to say it's been great listening to the um, previous speakers as well, and particularly that um, a, a career doesn't have to be a linear path as well. Um, we've had two very wiggly talks about careers already, and we're about to get a third. And I think that's um, a really important take home from this. Um, this time we're spending together today is that uh, we're often told as a society that you have to know what you want to be and you have to pursue it. and do you know what? If you do, that's great. And if you're not knocked off that course for whatever reason, that's also great. But um, yeah, wiggly careers and bouncing around different places and trying different things. Um, it can also be a really great way to expand your skill sets and um, who you are and what you want to be. Um, so I did my PhD at the University of Leicester in astrophysics, working on um, explosions that happened at the very edge of the universe and the few tiny little pinpricks of light that we would get and that would be collected by a very cool um, satellite. And I would have to run very difficult Monte Carlo situation at uh, simulations to try and figure out what these two or three photons meant in the context of the universe which all sounds very grand um but it actually ended up being quite lonely and while I certainly didn't have the worst PhD experience you could hear of um I definitely finished my PhD not so much in love with research not really having the appetite for going on that postdoc hunt of you're lucky if you get a one-year contract pinging around all over the place um and so I started looking for uh, jobs outside of academia uh, and if you go to any careers fair as a physics PhD um, they tell you that you are perfectly qualified for data science so off I went on to various jobs uh, sites looking for data science roles um, but I didn't just want anything um, I, I felt quite strongly that I didn't want to you know end up in data science for a company where like you know the CEO's bottom line was all that mattered um, and so I ended up being very lucky in that I was hired for the research engineering team at the Alan Turing Institute. And this gave me a really um, interesting way to stay connected to research, to 
doing something I felt was valuable that wasn't just about making money for some company but I was also separate from everything that had like worn me down about being an academic researcher you know like my job wasn't dependent on how many citations I got anymore and I was in a permanent position as well um so it was an incredibly privileged and amazing opportunity for me um not just in terms of job security and sort of feeling safe but also um, the Turing Institute, it's the National Institute for Data Science and um, Artificial Intelligence of the UK, and it has 13 partner universities across the UK, as well as industry partners, which meant I got the opportunity to work on a lot of different projects, both as a data scientist, so um, kind of like crunching data, but also research software engineering, so that's about creating software packages um, from like ideas that can be um, that can be used uh, outside uh, the specific research domain. And that's like where I really found um, what I wanted to do. Like it turned out that I didn't really like reading upon all of the maths to do all of the various data science algorithms, but um, I really loved writing a nice little Python package. Um, and one project I was put on very early on in my career at the Turing Institute was the Turing Way, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. And I thought this was a brilliant opportunity because um, while I was told that I was like perfectly skilled to be a data scientist, when I actually arrived at the Turing Institute, um, my PhD hadn't um, hadn't actually given me a lot of the tools I was expected to know. So. Um, I couldn't use version control. I couldn't use Git. Day one of my job at the Turing Institute, I like created my GitHub account and um, and the Turing Way was just starting up and it was this guide for people to do reproducible research. And it, it was like gonna be all of these tools that I needed to know to do my job right. Um, perfect opportunity, except that wasn't what PI Kirsty Whitaker had in mind for me. She was just like, no, I need you to go and build Binder. <laughs> and this is um, Binder being a platform for hosting reproducible computational environments in the cloud that use Jupyter Notebooks as an interface. And I'm just I'm like, I don't even know version control. And all of a sudden I need to learn about cloud infrastructure and Docker and reproducibility and uh, continuous deployment and everything. And this is also my um, journey the beginning of my journey with open source um, and Project Jupiter, of which Binder is a part. And that was where I kind of really grew into my confidence of collaborating with people, collaborating with people openly on GitHub um, and sort of diving into these really, really technical skills that are actually um, very well sought after actually at the minute. Um, and I got getting involved in the community and sort of all these open source project management things we need. I still run and chair the monthly team meetings for Jupyter Hub. Um, and so like fast forward a couple of years, um, continuing my work in, in the Turing, maintaining my contributions to Binder, helping run my binder.org, setting up a whole new cluster to donate to the Binder Federation, um, as well as continuing to um, contribute to the Turing Way. I was very privileged in that um, I was in a job that supported me and allowed me to spend some of my time working towards um, these aspects. Um, but then also what was happening at the same time was a, a new startup was being pulled together around this idea that Jupyter, Jupyter Hub, it's, re it's a really useful, powerful tool to bring data scientists into the cloud, running cloud optimized data analyses and like really pushing that bleeding edge of technology in the research sphere. But maintaining, operating, developing a Jupyter Hub in the cloud that is scalable, robust, 
um, and reliable, it's really, really, really hard. And most people are like paying a poor postdoc to do it for them. And those poor postdocs are, um, you know, overwhelmed and definitely not paid enough money and don't have enough experience <laughs> to do that reliably. So, um, yeah, the startup was um, uh, spinning up that would basically provide DevOps expertise in Jupyter Hubs in the cloud as a service. So it's um, to I2C, the uh, International Collaborative, no, hang on, I always get this wrong, International Interactive Computing Collaboration. Um, and yeah, we're basically spinning up these um, Jupyter Hubs that are ready for research um, with all of the scientific uh, kind of environments they're used to in the cloud and managing all of these things and you know enabling like DAS scaling for multi-processing multi and such like that um, and we're doing that for uh, universities and educational groups around the world the very first hub I spun up for um, as in this role was actually for a group in Ghana in Africa which is amazing but we're running hubs for universities in Berkeley Canada and um it's yeah kind of like taking off that service burden um to like really let the researchers do what they um what they're best at and making it and like bringing that cutting edge technology to them in a way that's easy to use is like really rewarding. Um, and it's like full of value for me. Um, but yeah, um, my little cuckoo clock has just gone off saying I've spoken for 10 minutes. I kind of tailed off towards the end there. So I apologize for that. And I'm very happy to answer any clarifying questions <laughs> on that rather rambly discussion. But thanks a lot, Sarah. Aaron, yeah, of applause for Sarah. Thanks a lot. Um, I see already a question in the in the notebook in the oh, sorry in the other part. I would manage to say what. I mean. um, so how how to stay up update about job opportunities or in job like yours? Um, so there is. Uh, the Society of Research Software Engineering, um, which I highly recommend joining, um, and they have a vacancy um, board that basically lists all of the jobs that are available in sort of the research engineering space across the UK, but also in places like the Netherlands and the US where the, their own RSE movements are starting to spin up, um, but they're a little bit behind the UK, like... Um, you find the German, Netherlands, US um, RSE groups tend to piggyback off a lot of the UK infrastructure. Like rather than having their own Slack spaces, we all just share the UK one. So I guess we can't really call it the UK one anymore. Um, but there's that um, vacancies page. Um, honestly, uh, when I moved from the Turing to 2I2C, I was like, I was starting to get that like uncomfortable feeling like maybe I need to move on starting to like read job adverts in a sense of like trying to pick out what I want and what I wouldn't want in a job but then when the job ad for 2i2c came along and I read that and like it was people from Jupiter Hub who spun up 2i2c so like I, I know them all I've even met a couple of them um, but that job ad came along and I read it and it was like oh my god they're writing about me even though I wasn't headhunting, headhunted at all, but um, it was, it really is the dream role. And it was like, what I was passionate about, what I was, good, what I was good at and where I knew I could really apply and grow my skills. And that is just incredibly lucky. Um, but it was like two and a half years in the making of like that initial touch point with Binder through the Turing way that meant I went on that skill up journey of being able to do that job and wanting to do that job in the first place. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, 
We have a question also, when did you feel ready enough to start applying to data science related work? Given that there are so many opportunities, you, okay, you kind of already answer, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, like before the Turing job, the answer is I didn't. I was in a very like dark place emotionally when I finished my PhD and it was just like, I need a job. And um, it was that case. And I will say this, like, the job hunting experience when you're moving out of your PhD into the real world, that is like one of the worst job hunting experiences you'll ever have. And it will also never be that bad again because you're new, you're shiny, you're untested um, and you have limitations on funding will run out and you're in student accommodation. And like, it's just a whole load of stress all at once. Whereas like once you've got that first job and you're starting to think about moving on, you can do it much more on your own time frame because, um, you know, you might, if, you, if you're in a secure position, you know, you don't have to be sending out hundreds of applications a week. You can pick and choose. You can decide how and when you tell your boss and you can decide your leaving date and your next start date and you're much more in control. Um, so the answer was I never felt ready to apply for a data science job and I actually switched my job title from data scientist to research software engineer at the um, during my tenure at the Turing Institute so I would say I'm still not ready for a data science job. <laughs> Thanks for the answers. I mean, there is another one that is, um, how did you get the job at the Turing Institute given that you, you, were, you still were to learn many skills that you needed for that position in the first place? But differently, what do you think has convinced the Institute to give you the job? I once asked my line manager who was on my interview panel, why did I get that, that job? And part of the job was um, we had to demonstrate our coding ability as well so I had like a Jupyter notebook that I presented to them and my line manager's response was I remember your code had a lot of really nice comments I think their standards have improved since then I hope they've improved since then <laughs> but um I think what was really important about getting that job wasn't so much what skills I did or didn't have it was the ability to learn and pick up skills quickly, which I had. Um, because when you're bouncing from project to project that could be you know, very academic, then going to industry, it could be on finance, and then going to health, and you know, you're know, you going across domains and expertise. Like we said there were like three things that you'd have on any project. There'd be a tool you were using, an algorithm you were applying, and a domain you were working in. And the best case scenario is you'd already have some experience of two of those and you'd need to learn the third. But sometimes you might only have experience in one of those and you need to learn two. Um, so, yeah, like what I learned from that team at the Turing was that learning is good. We don't always have the skills and that's not something to be ashamed of so long as you can commit to picking something up. And I had a moment just before I changed my job role, actually, that was just like, and sometimes you, you just have to say, actually, this is a skill I can't pick up and I'm struggling. And um, uh, yeah, and that was all of the, the math things with data science algorithms that I found overwhelming. I was just like, what's, what's the minimum I can do on this project to fulfill my, um, to fulfill my role, given that I'm struggling so much? Other thanks. Other follow up question on that. Um, so you already answered. What skills do you think from someone starting as a research uh, software engineer should have? I think you somehow already answered the question. But then, uh, how or what can you learn on the job? I like the how can you learn on the job? Yeah. Um, so I feel like base level. Um, version control and being able to like work with others on a software project is a really good skill to have. Um, 
for learning how on the job, here's the get out of free get out jail free card. The very first word in your job title is research. That often that often means like when you're beginning this project, no one knows what it's going to look like at the end. We don't know what the pathway to the end product is going to look like. A lot of it is just trying and failing and being okay with that and moving on to the next thing to try. Um, and I was lucky in that I had a lot of opportunity to learn a lot of different things. And um, yeah, um, it's more about, I was expected to learn on the job. Therefore I just did. I think you need to have that um, commitment from your line managers and the people you're working with up front. Thanks. I think I will just finish with one question and then we can continue. I don't know you, what, uh, what do you think, but one question. Malvika has a hand up. <laughs> ah, okay, so I cannot see, it's really strange. I don't see everybody. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, my question is actually for both Aki and Sarah. Um, so you and I were like back chatting, it's like, oh my God, is, is this uh, really it's really nice to hear that people who've gone through this wiggly career paths and even experienced lots of failures and you know Sarah you also shared you know people during PhD go through a lot of like mental stress um, and you still end up finding something which is a personal success for you um, so that was just a comment that thank you for sharing. I, th I think that this panel was super raw in terms of how openly you all shared your, you know, paths and career and failure and successes. So thank you for that. I wanted to just ask one question, which is further away from personal career, but both of your career is a lot about collaborating with people and often not just collaborating, um, working with them in a, in a, in a work culture that might be very different for each other. I don't know if that makes sense. So I, I mostly wanted to hear what you think about collaboration in highly evolving world, both for Aki in open research grant making and you in the software development. I mean, yeah, collaboration was another one of those things that I like had to learn how to do because um in like retrospect now I say academia does collaboration with a lowercase c as opposed to the capital case c uh, um that I think we do now in that collaboration academia is very much about okay you as a PhD student have done these done this analysis and now you're going to write this paper with these four other professors and that's kind of like collaboration. And even if you look at like big projects like LIGO and CERN, they still have a very different model of collaboration um, and in amongst like these thousands of scientists as well. And then coming into open source and software engineering, it's about co-design and it's like collaboration very much from the beginning of the project um and across so many different aspects not just like what language are we going to write this package in but like community government governance and how we're going to onboard people and like all of that is co-designed with other people that you're working with uh, who might have an interest in that to like various different degrees and I think you always have to be always have to be open to your collaboration methods changing and iterating and basically nothing is ever finished because it can always get better as the world evolves around us. Aki. Absolutely uh, agree with those points. <clears throat> I always think about um, collaboration as being um, so much about respect and you respecting what the other party or parties is bringing to this particular project uh, but also what they're getting out of it if it's something that benefits you and your work massively but not so much the other person you interact with them differently than if it's more of a an, an even playing field um, and I think almost 
even more difficult is reflecting that back the other way. And when people are ask, reaching out, asking you for help, you needing to really balance like how much are you really able to give to that within the confines of what you need to be, you need to protect what you're doing as well as um, your collaboration with, with others as well. And so it's, um, yeah, I think those are two, two, diff two very different sides of the, um, the same coin, but it's really important to think about, yeah, from both sides, what um, you're getting out of it versus what is needs to be put in. And so, I mean, this in reality, for me, it's sort of how long do I leave it before I follow up this email with this person? How shirty do I get with them? <laughs> and, um, but it, I think it applies uh, to a lot of other things that don't just involve emails. Thank you very much. So I'm going to then go ahead and close this session a few minutes to spare and reflect on all you've heard. So thank you all the speakers for, for your talk, for being here, for sharing your story, uh, creating a narrative, which is more than a single academic career. So that we are very grateful for. Um, before we go, uh, we do have a small reflection exercise where it isn't per se an assignment. It's something that you should think about for yourself as you build the project that you're building in open research. So there are three questions that we are asking you to think about as you go about walking outside your house and have your coffee um, and someday come down and write it down for yourself. So a prompt one is what brought you to work and to open leadership? What makes you feel motivated at work and beyond? Second is what would you need to maintain that feeling of motivation or the work that you're doing for another five years? So is this something that you're able to continue? And then can you maintain that for the rest of your career? Um, and these prompts are being asked so that you can adjust your life and the work that you're doing, the balance you're creating, so that you can sustain your energy for a long term, uh, the, the mission that you have set for yourself in open science. We will also revisit that in one of our future calls, but that should be enough for now. Thanks once again, everybody. Uh, please do leave us some questions if you may have a feedback, how this session went for you. Um, and please keep chatting on Slack. Thanks once again. Take care.